Good morning. We are in Genesis chapter 3. We're going to continue our study in Genesis today. We've already studied verse by verse, starting at Genesis 1-1. And we've worked ourselves up to where we are today. We're going to start at verse 8 in chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 is where we'll start the study. But we need to see the context. So we need to start reading at verse 1. And I will tell you that the context does change slightly at verse 8. But let's see the whole picture. Start reading at Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I was listening to a preacher this week teach on this text and because uh, I was curious what he would say and he was reading from some version of the Bible I don't know what it was and you know what verse 5 read in his Bible it said ye shall be as God ye shall be as God hmm I don't know he never did say what version he was using and I didn't know what it was I didn't recognize the sound of it but um but ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. But anyway, we know what our Bible says. Verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Verse 8, now that's where our study starts today. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto, the, unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, 
till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Or excuse me, shalt thou return. Verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the God sent, excuse me, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from, from, from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, we hadn't read the full chapter up until this point, but I felt, felt like it was time we take in the whole context and the whole picture. We already know the story, and most of us are very familiar with it. Brother Ricky? I have a question. Yeah. At the start, you read that you shall not cut nor it. So when she actually cut the fruit, is that when her eyes were really open? No. She, see, God didn't tell her not to touch it. She added that to what oh, God said. Okay. Yeah, God said, don't eat it. And then she, she told Satan or the serpent, God said, don't touch it or don't eat it and don't touch it. Yeah, so she was already, she was already not, well, not that she wasn't remembering. I believe she was changing what God had actually said because of her doubt. You know, she, she stopped, stopped believing God's final word or God's word was final and she started adding to it just like we do because of our sinful nature yeah good question though brother Ricky I want you to notice something starting in chapter 3 verse 8 and we go through that just that short little text down to verse 10 those three verses right there we already see that uh, Adam and Eve automatically as soon as they have sinned they're separated from God all right, they're separated because of several things, but the main reason is because of disobedience, because of sin. That separated them from God, as we know. But I want you to look at verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, they heard his voice, and you can't tell by voice if somebody's walking, you know, you don't know what they're doing, but they evidently, it, it appears now, and we're just, we're really surmising a lot here. We're gathering from just what it says here. It appears that they were used to God walking in the garden with them in the cool of the day. We don't know that for sure, but it appears that. Now, I want you to remind you of something. Remember that when God appeared in any part of the Old Testament, before Jesus came to Bethlehem, anytime God appeared to people in the Old Testament in a bodily form, in a human form, it was a Christophany, it was a, an appearance of Jesus, the God the Son, the Son of God, appearing in bodily form. He would take on that bodily form just like he did when he came to the earth, except he stayed in that bodily form there. In the Old Testament, he would appear so that man could, so we could relate to him. So we'd have a connection so we could see him because you can't see God. He's spirit. And, uh, but the second person of the, of the Godhead, God the Son, is the one who takes on that appearance for people to see uh, in this earthly uh, world that we live in. So we see a, an appearance of God in the garden and he comes and he walks in the garden in the cool of the day, sometime probably in the evening, who knows. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the trees in the garden were meant for a lot of things, but they weren't intended to be 
hiding places from God. And uh, it, it amazes me that Adam and Eve, in their perfect mind and perfect knowledge of God, sinless uh, condition that they were in before they sinned, that they would even think that they could hide from God. But see what sin had already done? The rebellion to God had already corrupted their thinking so that they even thought they could hide from God. But the thought that the, the thought that came into their mind was to hide from God. Separation. You know how it is when, when children have disobeyed mom and dad. Mom and dad walk into the room or they know mom and dad are coming back at the, any minute. What do they do? They either hide or they turn their head or they won't look at you. Right? There's that distance. There's that separation between parents and children. And the same thing has happened here. There's disobedience. And that sinfulness in their mind has already caused them to be separated from God in their own minds. They know they're not acceptable to God in the condition they're in anymore. They're not acceptable to God. So they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. And remember now, remember Genesis chapter 1 we saw, we saw a God named. Remember that? I want to remind you of that. Uh, verse 1, Genesis 1-1, one, one, the beginning, God. Verse uh, 2, the Spirit of God. Verse 3, and God said. We see one name for God, okay? Elohim. Remember, it's a plural name. But here, we see, in chapter 2, we noticed all of a sudden, God was called the Lord God. Chapter 3 carries over the same thing. The Lord God, Jehovah Elohim, Jehovah God. Don't forget that. And we talked about the meanings and all that, and we're not going to go back to all that, but it's just trying to remind you as we study, verse nine says, or verse 8 says, from the presence of the Lord God. In chapter 3, verse 8, the Lord God. Um. So we see, man, we see mankind, the human race, Adam and Eve, are already, they know they're separated from God because of their disobedience. Before sin entered the scene, uh, they, they, they enjoyed a, an unbroken, complete fellowship with their creator, with God Almighty. And uh, there was, but once sin has disrupted that and disturbed that, then that, that fellowship has been broken. All right. Um, If you look at verse 9 with me, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? The first thing I want to remind you of, when God asks a question, God always knows the answer. Remember? He always knows. He knew where Adam was. He knew where Adam was. Uh, but he called to Adam. He wants to bring Adam back close to him, doesn't he? Adam knows he's separated from God by his disobedience, by his sin. But God wants to call him close to him again. He wants to call him close to him. So he called to Adam, asked him where he was, but he already knew where he was, of course. If God's asked a question, he already knows the answer. He's doing it for our benefit, not his own. But, I, I'm, and I'm so thankful, aren't you, that God seeks us. When we sin, we disobey, God automatically, immediately, God is already drawing us back to him. He's seeking us. He's trying to draw us back to be close to him again. That's, we call it today the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's what we call it in New Testament times. The convicting voice of the Holy Spirit drawing us, convicting, showing us that we're sinful, showing us we have sinned, showing us we need to confess it and get right with God and be close to God again. That's that voice of the Holy Spirit drawing us and convicting us. We need to obey that voice. Um, this is the first time that God has asked Adam or Eve when he's come to the garden, where are you? Why are you hiding from me? This is actually what he was asking. But where are you? Verse 10, and Adam said, and he said, I 
heard thy voice in the garden and look what's happened for the first time a new emotion and I was afraid a brand new emotion in the human race for the first time mankind is afraid of God they had no reason to be afraid before no reason but sin causes us to be afraid it brings fear and it ought to bring fear when we're disobedient to God but that's what happened to Adam he's afraid and his he knows that he's that he's been disobedient he said I was afraid and then he said because I was naked and I hid myself well God asks him another question verse 11 he said who told thee that thou wast naked God already knows he doesn't need to ask for himself now carefully now look carefully who told thee that thou wast naked hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat now God asks two questions right and when God asked these two questions of Adam, notice he didn't ask Eve. I want you to notice that, ladies. He didn't ask Eve. He asked Adam. Eve is the one who was deceived. Eve is the one Satan came to. God comes to Adam. All right? And there's a reason for that. And I want to explain it in just a minute because it's a, a wonderful picture of how God works and how Satan works. And I say wonderful in the sense that there is great wonder in this. There's great amazement and, and consistency. God always works the same way, and Satan always works the same way. All right? Because Satan, Satan is very predictable. Satan is very predictable. And God is always consistent. God never changes. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So we heard Adam's reply, and God asked two questions. Who told thee that thou wast naked? And, and there are several, this, and this goes, verse 10 and 11 get very deep. Okay? Deep in the sense that here we see the function or the way, the, the way that uh, God's plan should function. All right? For example, it's like this. When God created Adam and Eve, he did not create them in the same way, did he? He created Adam from the dust. He created Eve from Adam's side. So the, from automatically from the very beginning, there was a difference. A difference in the way they're created. When God... Uh, when God established this marriage between them, because he gave Adam a wife. All right? He didn't say, I gave you a, a live-in woman. He said, I gave you a wife. And she, he became her husband. God established that marriage. Now, uh, does anybody know what the word husband means? We know the word in agriculture. Yeah. Yeah. We, when, when somebody cares for an orchard, what's that called? Husbandry. Yeah, husbandry. The, the action of taking care of it is called husbandry, and that, which means to care for, all right? to manage, to care for, to protect, to guide. All of those things are involved in it. Now, God called Adam her husband, and he called Eve his wife. Now, I don't know the meaning of wife. I haven't looked that up. <laughs> I forgot to look that one up. So you, you can tell me later, okay? And it's not important because the main thing we know is is that God established this marriage with a function for each person, a role in the, in the marriage each person has so that the marriage will function properly. All right? So it will, the, every, the meshing, the putting together of those two people will function like it ought to. 
the way God intended it to function. Now, um, my wife and I were discussing a, a situation uh, this week, and uh, and and it brought back memories of of my own ignorance as a young husband, Miss Betty. Brought me, reminded me of how much I failed as a young husband and, uh, and trying to learn and didn't know what I was doing and, and had made a lot of bad decisions, a lot of bad mistakes, and, and all of those things. And it reminded me of that because <clears throat> I was, we were discussing a young couple, and this young couple are having some problems because they don't have, they're, they're not functioning the way they ought to in their family. They're each, they're, they're, they're not mixing the roles they have, they're just ignoring the roles they have. Each of them has a role in the family, and that doesn't mean that the role of the wife is to be barefoot and pregnant. It doesn't mean that the wife's role is to wash dishes, clean the house, scrub the floor, feed the kids, uh, do the laundry. That's not the role that we're talking about, all right? And the role of the husband is not to come in from work and sit down and say, get me something to drink, I'm tired. That's not the role. All right? And I'm using these, these scenarios because that's what most people think when they hear Christians talk about husband and wife roles, biblical roles. They think, oh, yeah, we know what you're talking about. And they automatically jump to that conclusion that that's what we mean. That's not it at all. Not at all. We've been, you know what's wrong with the, uh, the way people see uh, Christian homes today? Now, it's, not the, what the, it's not the Bible that's the problem. It's what, what's wrong with it is the corrupted thinking that comes from sin. That's what's wrong. And people, even Christians, a lot of Christians, have the wrong idea about what the home ought to be like, which starts with husband and wife, the marriage. That's where the home starts, isn't it? Now, God set up this marriage, this home, to have, to each, for each person to have functions, have roles, so that everything works smoothly and works well. All right? Jesus Christ and God the Father and God the Son set up the perfect example to show us how that's supposed to work. Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are submissive to God the Father. There is one head, and God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are equal, absolutely equal. But the Spirit and the Son are submissive to the Father. They, and, and the New Testament tells us over and over how the, the uh, and Jesus even said the words, you know, no one knows but the Father uh, when, the, when, the, when the Messiah will come. And all of those things. There are many, many explanations and, and definitions of how the Father was um, the head and the other two members of the Holy Spirit, of the Trinity, are submissive. But they're equal. So it has nothing to do with equality or inequality. It has to do with just somebody functioning as the leader and somebody functioning as the follower. Hold on. I mentioned we were talking about this young couple the other day, and the reason that they're having trouble is because they're, got, they're, not, they're ignoring their functions. They're ignoring their roles, which means the husband is messing up not because he's trying to be a, dad, a bad father or a bad husband. That's not what his problem is. The problem is he's not leading, which means... In a young husband's mind, he, leading means uh, you need to clean the house. You need to do the laundry. Right? That's what most people think. That's not it. The husband needs to lead by setting the example. Picking up his own laundry and putting it in a dirty clothes hamper if he needs to. Taking it and putting it in a washing machine and turning the washing machine on if he needs to. Do something to lead, not to, not to uh, drive or boss, but to lead. And the young wife in this family, she's ignoring her role by spending too much time on Facebook, spending too much time on the, on the internet, 
uh, selling this or doing that, you know, and all kinds of fun stuff like that, instead of fulfilling her role as a wife and a mom. These young couples, and, and this is not unique, is it? It's not different. I mean, that's, that's typical today. The two ignore their roles and they go, they still try to live like they're single, no responsibilities. Uh, husbands like to go out and buy their toys. You know, I got to go buy me a new tool. I got to go buy me a new this. I got to go buy me this thing. It doesn't matter what the family needs. It doesn't matter if we got the money or not. It doesn't matter if we can afford it. It's just because that's what I want. Right? They, they, they're not taking the responsibility they have seriously. Adam and Eve all of a sudden found out this is serious. When God says don't, then we shouldn't. Right? It's serious when we disobey God. And Adam and Eve showed us the first time that somebody disobeyed God how serious it is. Don't take lightly the commands of God, folks. It's serious. And, I and I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you. Adam said, uh, excuse me, verse 11, God said, who told thee that thou was naked? Now, I mentioned all this the way everybody functions and God's setting up all this for a reason. When God asked Adam, who told you you were naked? That question tells us a whole lot. And this is the, the basis of it all right here. When before Adam and Eve sinned, all of their knowledge, all of their information, all of their input came from God to Adam. Got it? Adam was the one that God spoke to and gave the instructions for the family. Adam was the one God spoke to. Remember, there's got to be a, a leader. God would come to Adam. All of a sudden, God knows. Of course, God knows everything. He knows what's happened. And God knows that Adam has stepped out of his place and he's stopped listening to the source of knowledge. He stopped listening to his source. He stopped listening to the one he's supposed to listen to. Somebody else has started talking to Adam. And we'll see in just a minute what happened. How that everything got out of order. And when it got out of order, that's when things fell apart. So first he says, who told you you were naked? Who told you this? Because God knows somebody else has been talking to Adam. He's gotten, a, he's gotten his information from somebody besides God. Verse 11, the middle of the verse, Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? God already knows he's eaten of the fruit. He knows that. But he's reminding Adam, I told you not to eat that. I commanded. I commanded you. Now, notice God did not say, why did you do that? God didn't ask why. Because then Adam would have to, he, he might try to excuse himself or give a reason for why he did it, right? Make an excuse. You know, one of the, when we're raising our kids, and oh, how many times have I done this? Oh, my. You know, one of the biggest mistakes we make is not, we, we ask our children, why did you do that? Why did you do that? And most kids are going to say, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the most common answer you get? Yeah. I don't know. Right? Because, I mean, the kids, he's honest. He doesn't know, but you know he did it because he wanted to. So don't deal with the why. Deal with the, the fact that he did it. Right? Yeah. God didn't ask, why did you do that, Adam? He already knows why. The parents know why kids do what they do. We're not silly. We know. But for the kid to try to explain that to mom and dad, well, I just wanted it. You know, it just looked good. And I just didn't, I didn't want to obey you. They're not going to say that. Because that's not going to help them. 
That doesn't help the situation. So I ask them a question that you know that you're not going to get the straight answer. You know what the answer is going to be. I don't know. Hey, I've done that so many times. I can't count how many. But all parents do it. Every mom and dad does the same thing. Why did you do that? Right? It's just not, it's not the right question. All right? The question is, or the observation should be, I want you to notice, I want you to look at what you've done. And help them right away to see you have disobeyed. Not try to explain their excuses for doing it, but this is what you've done. You've disobeyed. You've been disobedient. Okay? But it's our natural tendency to say, why? We understand that. I know it. I know it. Oh, I know it very well. You know, what is it they say? It takes one to know one? <laughs> Boy, do I know about that. Because I, I tell I know about it. It's because I've done it. But it's not, the, it's not the right response. God used the right response, as he always does. He said, who told you? He didn't ask because he needed to know. He asked to get Adam to realize, hey, you, you used to listen to me. Now you're listening to somebody else. And then he said, did you eat of that fruit? Did you take from that tree I told you? I commanded you not to eat of that. He's not asking because he needs to know. He's asking to help Adam say, you have disobeyed me. You did what I commanded you not to do. All right? So God deals with, in great wisdom with this problem. Not trying to understand Adam's reason, but ha helping Adam understand his sin. Okay? His sin. And that's what we need to do with our children as well. It's a great example. It really is. But uh, by the way, folks, when you do something wrong, don't try to... Uh, uh, explain in your own mind don't try to explain to yourself why you did this don't try to reason it out and say well you know everybody else does it or you know it's not that bad or uh, nobody's going to know about this but me you know don't try to reason it out when the holy spirit's convicting your, your heart of your sin immediately admit to god that sin and confess it and ask for forgiveness uh, I promise you things will go a lot better with you, if you will, if you handle it that way. And I'm learning about that as well, okay? Now, uh, <laughs> I want to jump back to one more thing just before we leave it, before we leave this text. In, uh, in, in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, this is an extremely familiar text to all of us. Luke 19, 10 says, For the Son of Man come is come to seek and to save that which was lost you know back there in verse 9 uh, excuse me uh, da, 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 do, do. verse 9 and the lord god called unto adam and said unto him where art thou when god called out to adam it's a, the first time we see god reaching out to a sinner and calling him the first time we see it but over in Luke 19, 10, what Jesus tells us that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He does that for us too, doesn't he? He's still doing the same thing. That's why Jesus came. It's the same reason God called out to Adam. Same reason. Uh, mm, there's so much here. <laughs> there's so much. I guess before we get... We, we better stop because it, I want to keep going. I want to keep going, but we're going back to the structure of the family and the function of the family. We're going back to that in the study because it all happened. It all is explained very clearly uh, as the way God dealt with Adam, then Eve, then the serpent. And then when God passed out judgments, God dealt with the serpent, and then Eve, and then Adam. And I'll show you all that. It's really fascinating how this, uh, this simple text is one of the saddest texts in the Bible, but it's also one of the most exciting because we see the first promise of Messiah coming, first promise of the Redeemer coming in this text. Um, 
There's just so much there that I, I, I'm having trouble stopping because I really want to get into that. I'm, I'm looking at my notes to see if there's something I can throw in here. We talked about the, 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 the efforts of Adam and Eve last week, how they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, and uh, that's a very puny excuse back there in verse 7. It says they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons and all of those things. Um, see, it's not, it's not really sissy for a man to wear an apron, by the way, okay? But it didn't, it, it didn't last long, did it? That's really way off topic, isn't it, sweetheart? It's way off. Okay. Because <laughs> they, they, they figured an apron was enough, but when God made them clothes, he made them coats. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Verse 21, And unto Adam and also to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. He didn't just make them an apron. All right? And uh, I know I'm being kind of, off the wall and kind of silly, but at the same time, I'm just trying to help you uh, see how ridiculous it is that we try to fix everything and our efforts are wasted. We need to let God work in our lives. All right, um, I'm going to stop because I want to start next time. I want to start at this same text and we're going to go uh, to almost to the end of the chapter. All right, and it covers a lot. And I, if I start now, I won't, I won't even get a good... Uh, get into it much any questions or anything to add any questions anything to add come on in brother ricky could he have dealt even more harshly to satan at the time for what he just told him he was going to be doing from then on you mean go ahead and send him to the bottomless pit So Ricky's question is: Could God have, could God have dealt with more seriously, more harshly with, uh, with uh, the devil, with Satan at that time, for what he had done to Adam and Eve? Sure, he could have, but he chose not to. He didn't fit in his plan. God had a wise, very wise plan already planned out, and because uh, he knew, he knew which way we were going. You know that thing of the foreknowledge of God is goes much further than we can ever imagine God already knew it so God already had a plan and uh, so uh, in order for people to have a choice then I guess God needs to give them a choice I wonder if he could have made it just a little bit for them to understand who he was going to turn out to be you mean Satan himself Well, here in the curse, we don't really see uh, Satan himself cursed. He's already cursed. You know, we don't see any punishment on him. We see the tool he used, the serpent, uh, suffers the curse because that was the tool used by Satan. Uh, but as far as Satan, you know, his punishment is to come. And uh, God's already got that planned out for him. But to change his plan... When God already knew what was going to happen, God already had a plan. You know, He already knows. So I, I can't understand why God would want to change His plan when He already has one that's perfect. So um, you know, He's already got He's already got the the end of the book's already been written. You know, He's already got the story figured out. And uh, and Satan knows Satan knows the Bible. He knows what's going to happen. He just doesn't believe it. He's a liar and he's he's a deceiver but he's deceived. He deceives himself. He tells himself lies and he believes them. Could he have limited his reign as far as what he actually could do? Because I think Job, you know, what he let happen to Job, you know, I mean, he just wiped Job completely out of everything he ever had or loved. Yeah. 
Yeah. And well, that's always the crucial point to there you go. Uh, the Christian. But and to Job Satan, too. To let Satan have that much reign. Yeah. You know, I wonder if he could have leveled him off at a certain you know thing. But uh, like I said, it's the crucial point to everybody else that hey, yeah. I'm still in control and look what he now has. Amen. Yeah. Amen. But it, it, I mean, look how much we would have missed and how much the whole world would be lacking that knowledge about God and, and how he is in control and how Satan thinks he's in control. How much we would be missing if it wasn't for Job. If Job, if that had never happened and God had held him back and not let him attack Job and his family, then the whole world would have suffered a lot because of not knowing that. But because we know that, we have knowledge of that whole event then uh, we we are much wiser because of it and when we go through hard times i even heard a lost man say this week a lost person looked me in the eye and said i have no right to complain when i think about that fellow in the bible named job and what he went through you know so even he even lost people learn from the example whether they believe all of it or not i don't know or take it to heart but yeah there's a lot of people who would uh suffer a lot more and be worse off during their sufferings if it wasn't for the knowledge of Job and his his event that happened in his life. And I mean, so. I know he, Adam and Eve suffered a lot because they got kicked out. They were put out of right. the most perfect place there ever had been, and yet they were put out of that area that was perfect. Yeah. So. It's true. They did. Well, and, and to understand why God does what he does is one of those things that's way over our heads, certainly way over mine. And uh, we don't understand it. It's okay to ask why or what if God had done it this way or why didn't God do this. It's okay as long as we always come back to that same thing. Well, I know that God's in control and I know he does what's good. As long as we always come back to that answer, we're okay. Nothing. I always wondered if I really <laughs> if anybody will ask a question, it'll be Ricky. <laughs> but I think God's going to answer all your questions, and you won't even ask a question in heaven. I really don't think you'll have one question. I like your questions. It causes all of us to think, and that's good. But, no, I think even Ricky's going to be completely silent in heaven, except for his praise to God. Amen. All right. Uh, let's pray and uh, let Brother Ricky get back to the door. we got people pulling in. Thank you so much, Father, for your goodness, your wonderful grace. Let, Lord, thank you for the thing that we take for granted called foreknowledge. Your foreknowledge of everything in this world, universe, in our lives, and lives of people not even yet born, you already know. And you allow us to choose, but you already know what we're going to choose. Thank you, Father, for the foreknowledge you have, the wisdom and the, the all-seeing, all-knowing God that you are. But at the same time, you give us a choice. You allow us to choose. Father, that is beyond my understanding. And I pray that we will just trust you when we don't understand. We don't know why, but we trust you because we know you know why and you have uh, the your plan and your wisdom and your love for us is always at the front of everything you do. We thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen.